Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome along to our media roundtable today. We're hosting a uh, hosted by the ARC Group today with Tristan Sternson, who's the CEO, who is joining us today, along with Commissioner Shane Fitzsimmons and Senator Jim Molan, for a roundtable discussion on innovation in disaster response and preparedness. My name is Grant Chisnell. I'm the CEO of Left of Boom. I'm a crisis management advisor and I host a podcast called Crisis Talks. I'm really pleased today to be hosting this session because two of our guests have been uh, guests of mine previously on the podcast and they were amazing to talk to about their stories of resilience and leadership in the face of adversity. Um, today, what we're going to be going through is a bit more of a facilitated discussion, a panel-based discussion. So we'll take uh, questions at the end of the panel-based discussion around about uh, 30 minutes in. So please, if you have any questions, you guys, please post them into the chat box um, and we'll pick them up as we're going through and we'll add them to the group or we'll take those questions at the end. Um, today, though, before we kick off, what I want to do is firstly thank the ARC group and Tristan Sternson, uh, who's joining us today. They are the ones who are hosting the particular session. Uh, they do some amazing work in technology, particularly in the disaster preparedness space. So we're going to hear some excellent stories today about how technology and innovation can really shape the way we move forward around disaster preparedness and resilience. Uh, so without any further ado, let me introduce our panel guests today. So firstly, Senator Jim Molan, uh, he's led a distinguished life of service, firstly as an officer in the infantry, uh, finishing up as a general in the Australian Army, before uh, now representing as a Senator in the Liberal Party for New South Wales. Among many accolades throughout his life of service, Jim is a member of the Order of Australia, an officer of the Order of Australia, and also holds a Distinguished Service Cross. What many of you probably aren't really aware of, he is actually an accomplished pilot, helicopter pilot, and also volunteers in the local RFS where over the 2019 and 25 season, he was involved directly in supporting and responding to some of the fires around the Canberra region, uh, as well as representing the, the PM on a number of days throughout the fire season itself. Uh, more recently, and specific to his expertise around emergency management, uh, Senator Molan was invited as, a, uh, as an expert witness in 20, uh, sorry, in 2009, rather, uh, into the uh, Black Saturday Royal Commission, so the, uh, invited as a, a crisis management expert witness for that inquiry, uh, and also uh, has recently held a role as a director of the National Aviation Firefighting Centre up until 2016. So, Senator Molan, welcome along today. Thanks, Grant. Thank you very much. Now, our next Commissioner, Shane Fitzsimmons, probably doesn't need too much of an introduction because he's been really the face of the fires in the last season uh, and has led an extremely distinguished service as uh, starting as a 15-year-old volunteer in the Duffy's Forest Fire Brigade and finishing up in charge of 70,000 volunteers and firefighters working that 2019-2020 fire season. Uh, Commissioner Fitzsimmons, uh, has risen to become one of those most trusted faces in emergency management in disaster response, given the response there this year, um, and has been recognised for his efforts last year being named as the New South Wales Australian of the Year. It's probably the hot tip to take out the top gong in early in the new year. So, uh, Commissioner Fitzsimmons, welcome along today. I know you're heading up now the, uh, the Resilience New South Wales, I remiss of you to mention that, you're heading up now the newly formed department. Uh, Resilience New South Wales. So Commissioner Pitson is welcome along today as well. Good morning, Grant. Great to be with you. And last but not least, uh, not least our host today, or our, our uh, host organisation sponsoring today's event is the Art Group CEO, Tristan Sternson. He started his life as a techie, but now as a CEO, and is really at the forefront of innovation and technology and the way it can be used to support decision-making, particularly around the way we, we uh, analyse and group data to inform solid decision and intelligence in the way we think or operate. Um, more recently, we've seen that they've been involved with a number of government and state departments who are a wholly Australian owned company, and they've been recognized for, for their efforts in supporting Australia, both here and also government departments around the world for especially innovation in data-driven decision-making and artificial intelligence. Uh, as more specifically to the work they've done in the disaster management space, uh, Tristan and his team worked uh, in conjunction with the New South Wales region, uh, Rural Fire Service, excuse me, to develop the Fires Near Me app, which has been used to inform a lot of the decision-making for people out there affected by fires and making sure that they are remaining safe 
uh, and uh, aware and up to date of information that might be relevant for their own safety and wellbeing needs. So Tristan, welcome along today and thanks for hosting today. Yeah, thanks Brad, thanks Chair. Now, look, today we're gonna to be talking about innovation in disaster preparedness and resilience. And, and I think it'd be great to hear first from Commissioner Shane Fitzsimmons. Uh, Commissioner, what's, you know, in your recent experience, those sort of 13 years from 2007 to 2020, can you talk about some of the changes or some of the innovation that's happened in technology that's helped inform decision-making for your organization that you've led over those last sort of 13 to 14 years? Wow, and, and, and it's, it's frightening to think in only a decade or so, uh, through the Rural Fire Service and the Fire and Emergency Service industry, I've seen an extraordinary amount of change and, and the advent, no doubt, of, of new learnings and new ways of working with internets, uh, internets of things, uh, sharing data and, and information, collecting information, providing information internally and externally in the organisation has been extraordinary. Intranet pages for staff, but also for for teams of volunteers uh, to keep everybody up to date, but then also getting out into the community. Um, you know, in the last 13 years, we certainly didn't have social media. And you think about today um, using social media platforms and other technologies in the public information and warning space, um, the connectedness and tracking of aircraft, um, downloading uh, real time or as close to live imagery as we possibly can, which is very detailed and sophisticated imagery that can show us exactly the progression and movement and intensity of fires. We've got, uh, we've got the ability to look at predictive services. Uh, not only are we relying on the extraordinary uh, mental capacity of humans, but putting that into, into science and technology and, and um, modelling tools uh, to start predicting on a scale, uh, not just one fire, but multiple fires that might be burning. Uh, our websites, as I mentioned, um, um, the work of the work of telephone technologies, our ability in more recent years to be intrusive and get messages out to impacted areas, um, text messages to people's mobile phones, um, uh, recorded messages to landlines, the Fires Near Me app, where we can where we can provide information through our organisation up to the public facing website, but at the same time down to an app on your phone or your tablet that can give you information. Um, up-to-date, timely, relevant information about what's going on and, more importantly, about what you need to do. Our reach on social media uh, through the last fire season is another good example. And, and the growth in the last decade or so has just been exponential in this space. The curve is just what, like a big, sharp curve uh, rising up. And the more we do, the more expectations rise. And just to give you an idea, Grant, just during the last fire season, we did something like 9,000 updates on our website uh, the RFS website, um, that had seven and just under 8 million views on the website on one day alone. Uh, the Fires Near Me app was downloaded again last season, just under 3 million times. It was accessed 30 million times in November alone. Uh, we used telephone technology. We did 430 emergency alert campaigns. That resulted in hundreds of thousands of voice messages, over 2 million text messages going out to affected community on social media, Facebook posts, just under two and a half thousand posts from the organisation that had a reach of over 189 million unique users. So extraordinary reach and, and, and growth and similar similar sort of figures with Twitter with just under two and a half thousand uh, messages there and, and, and over 600,000 users. So, so every aspect of our business has been enabled and, and facilitated and supported with the use of technology and the, our only ability to get that information in at a state level, to share it in a, in a very public sense is because you've got to invest in systems and programs, uh, uh, procedures and behaviours that allows information to be captured and identified right at the coalface, but then uploaded into systems that can automatically feed and populate uh, platforms at the state level that can help make decisions uh, help inform and understand what's occurring and what we can expect, but also importantly, uh, to push out as timely and as accurate and as relevant uh, public information warnings as we can. You can then go into the firefighting arsenal. You look at technology and, and systems on fire trucks, on, on aircraft in the air, next generation of aircraft, the use of drones, small and, and, and not so small drones. It, you know, the world is changing and technology is absolutely underpinning all we do. And our reference point 
point on everything is spatial services, spatial layers, and having really good investments in, in data sets that can actually model the terrain and model the, the built environment on top of that terrain, how we're living, how we're working, where the critical infrastructure is, to allow us to make decisions around preventative and, and planning decisions, but also response and recovery decisions as well. Senator Mullen, you've gone from a role previously in the military where you were doing time sensitive targeting uh, using the exact same technology that Commissioner Fitzsimmons was referring to there, you know, drones, spatial overlays, et cetera, there, as well as intelligence overlays there. How important is this particular technology in really helping decision making, particularly for leaders um, in charge of the whole battle space or in charge of the whole operating space uh, when we have a natural disaster affecting this country? I'm, I'm unmuted now, which makes communication a lot easier. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, Grant. Thanks for the, thanks for the question. Uh, uh, we just we just heard Shane go through the most amazing list of uh, modern technologies, which he, as a crisis manager and as a public figure, uses on a day to day basis. In in my view, you've got to go back to fully understand the process uh, significantly. You've got to go back one step, and you've got to get, look at the bedrock of 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 what produces the technology. And I think I think that. Uh, the first the first aspect of the bedrock of, of technology, whether it's the military or in firefighting or anything else at all, emergency management in general, is, is the human spirit and the human mind. If you're not prepared to accept technology, if you're going to keep on doing things the way you used to do things, technology is totally useless for you. But there is an extraordinary willingness to accept uh, technology, uh, technological aids, and I think it will be greater now that we've seen uh, last summer's fires, uh, and people saw the concurrency of those fires. Now, uh, 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 if, if the human spirit is the first thing, the second thing is really money. And, and uh, if, if governments or society are not prepared to provide the resources to our, to our emergency management people, SES or RFS or, 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 uh, or anyone else, uh, the, the health organisations, uh, then we're not going to be able to accept that technology and, uh, and I'd say that, you know, uh, if, if you get the human spirit right, if you get the money right, and I remember w w when I first started at the National Aerial Firefighting Centre and met Shane and all the other people around him, uh, I, I very much, you know, we, we were at that time, we were looking at the introduction of very large air tankers and of looking at the technology that brought down a common operating picture. And uh, uh, we've now, we now see both of those things come into being. So I guess time is the next one for, 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 for uh, technology in, in, in introducing it. But I think that the, if, the, if those three things allow you to start on the process, I reckon policy uh, is, is the, the real bedrock of the introduction of technology. And if you look at where we've come, if you look at... Uh, innovation in policy in federal state relations we've come a million miles we've got a million miles left to go but we've come a million miles and and uh, none of us really had any questions as to who was doing what role until we hit the simultaneity of last year's bushfires and and people demanded uh, certain things from certain levels of government uh, and that has now through the New South Wales inquiry and through the Federal Royal Commission, uh, that's been clarified in a number of ways. That's the basis of it. Now we've got to match the policy to it. Uh, I, I think innovation in policy in relation to state and local government, uh, I think is critically important. Where the rubber hits the road so often is in local government. You know, who's responsible in many, many areas for the reduction of fuel loads? Uh, and, you know, we've got to avoid this bushfire Royal Commission cycle where you have a bushfire, you have a Royal Commission, everyone beats their chest and says, we've got to learn, we've got to do things. Everyone forgets about it over time and you have another bushfire and then you go back through the cycle again. And the, the idea of assurance, the idea of an organisation or a process which says, well, if you accepted 70 uh, recommendations from an inquiry or a Royal Commission, what have you actually done? Uh, I, I, and, and also the federal organisation 
I think is, is, is very, very important in relation to this, not, not just for the emergency management aspects, but for the permanent existence of a recovery organisation. And what, what I don't think I realised at the time was that we start recovering from day one. Somewhere in, on day one of the first fire of the, first, of the season, people will want assistance in recovering and we should be there and there'll be, there'll be innovative policy on that. So if you've, if you've got those, those, those things that allow policy to work, if you get the policies in a line and you've got a strategy that's more interested in practicality rather than ideology, you then come down to the techniques of the use of technology uh, from everywhere, from what Shane was doing, from the ability of Shane to communicate with the political leaders, with Shane's ability to go out and talk to the people, to, to provide confidence, you know, and even down as far as, as, the, as the, the trucks that we see, what's in, the, what's in the trucks and how the trucks help everyone to do everything. And of course, getting it into the public mind. So I, I'm not, you know, I can, I can make pronouncements. Of course, it's uh, on technology. Of course, it's critically important. But I've got to say in the short time I've been looking at it, not the 13 years that, that, that uh, uh, the commissioner has been looking at it, but in a much shorter period of time, let me just say that one of the, uh, we have come at the million miles that Shane described, but if I just mention one thing, and, and last week, uh, the Defence Force announced a defence investment of $173 million in new night fighting capability. So we will now, uh, we will now buy 5,500 helmet mounted night vision systems by 2023, which gives a combination of image intensification and thermal imaging, plus data being brought into the head-up display on an individual soldier. And guess what? That cost us $173 million. Now, I don't know what Shane's budget was, but you know, if, if, if a commissioner is going to go to the government and say, we need an aerial night fighting, an aerial night uh, 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 firefighting capability, uh, you're going to need innovative policy. You're going from from Casa. You're going to need time to do it. It took us, I reckon, it'll take two years to get such a capability into a significant number of aircraft. And then you've got to work out the technique. So it's not just it's not just innovation. It's all the other. It's not just innovation in technology. It's innovation in all the other areas I spoke to. Well, you've opened up a can of worms there, so I'm going to go straight into it. If that's okay, Senator Mullen, and um, this one's for both you. Mr. Simmons, Kristen, I'm leaving behind here. But, you know, we've had policy at federal level uh, since about 2011 around Institute of Disaster Resilience and, and particularly a disaster resilience framework that has been in place for, for uh, nearly 10 years. Why hasn't that worked when we were confronted by this biggest concurrent fire that we've ever seen, when we've had the experiences of 2009? So I'll go first to you, Commissioner Fitzsimmons, and come back to you, Senator Mullen. So I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand the premise of the question there, Grant, because We've ultimately a... the system did work. So I, I, can you just rephrase that question for me? Well, I think the policy around resilience has been in place for 10 years and we're talking about the, the mere miles that we've come in regards to bridging those gaps between the control boundaries, et cetera, between the states or other entities. Um, did that, was that a recognition then of what you're saying here? Is that a recognition that the system has worked? Or is there certainly things at the federal level that needs to be done better to ensure that that policy that Senator Mullen was referring to really does permeate through to the other jurisdictions? Yeah, so look, I, I do think fundamentally the system has worked and demonstrated that it's worked. But when it comes to building resilience and you look at prevention and mitigation activities ahead of any big event or a big disaster. They're called prevention and mitigation um, um, activities for a reason, because we're not talking about elimination. Uh, we can't eliminate uh, natural hazards and natural disasters and other stresses and emergencies that occur in society. So what we've got to do is have a, 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 a policy framework and, and construct that provides for the agility and the flexibility that's needed when we see uh, events of scale and magnitude like we've seen uh, in the last in the last year or so. And I think one of the areas where there is a lot of focus and an opportunity for 
for improvement uh, is our investment in times of crisis, particularly when it comes to recovery, rebuilding, repair and healing, is this investment around betterment. So it's, and, and the classic example I would use, which is a very practical example, is the old timber bridge network. So there's timber bridges still across the landscape. They burn out in fires. Uh, and whilst we've got the theory of replacing them with something better after the event, historically, we would end up replacing with a timber bridge. We'd wonder why the bloody thing burns out again the next fire. So the good thing is, in, in, in agile policy uh, discussion this year round, we are replacing burnt out and damaged timber bridges with concrete bridges. But we're also taking the time to raise the height of those timber bridges if it's sensible and practical to do so. So we're also then ameliorating uh, the impact of low lying floods and those sorts of things. So factoring resilience in. So there is no doubt though, Grant, the events of the last 18 months or more, the droughts, the bushfires, uh, the storms and floods uh, and the COVID pandemic uh, has has given rise uh, an opportunity to have a good review of the, the policy constructs and frameworks uh, and make sure they are contemporary and make sure that they are better um, uh, connected and joined up at a multi-jurisdictional level, fed from the local government platform, the community layer up to a state, national, uh, state and then national level to understand what that resilience framework looks like but most importantly, what are the investment opportunities to get the best results for building resilience uh, in communities to withstand disasters, events, emergencies, both natural uh, and, and human related uh, sorts of crises going forward? Senator Mullen, what's your thoughts there about the, I suppose, the federal responsibility as a part of that and the policy you referred to there before? Um, where does that meet the demands that are required in all of these disasters? Thanks, Grant. And a lot of a, a, a lot of the the, the demand uh, can pretty well almost never be met because, as uh, the commissioner said, as soon as you meet an expectation, the expectation increases. And this is a very human problem. We see it. We see it in almost everything we do in government. And I stood by the, you know, I spent 22 days down in the fires as the PM's rep down in the fires there over, over uh, Christmas. And for the first time in my life, I saw something in Australia that looked like refugees. And I've seen you and I have seen refugees all over the world. And it's an appalling circumstance for any country to have refugees. The evacuees coming out of the South Coast reminded me so strongly of, uh, of, of, uh, the refugees I'd seen throughout the world, uh, but these were different. The, the, these were different. Very in a very Australian sense, they were all in cars and they were streaming up the highway. Uh, and it just reminded me: who would ever have thought that in fire-prone areas we should have generators at service stations? I mean, the first thing that we spoke about before: the first thing that goes out is the power. Uh, and that takes out your mobile phone system, and it takes out. And but we're, we're moving uh, in resilience in, in those systems, I think relatively well. Uh, and uh, people started saying, "Well, you know, uh, I can't get fuel. There's fuel in the ground at service stations. I can't get fuel to drive my family out of here because there's no power going into the service stations." Now, uh, th th that's an easy one, but until you go through this ex this this experience, you're not going to be able to understand what areas of resilience you need. So uh, yeah, I, uh, plus the expectations. I, I'm, uh, I, I, of the experience I've had of uh, crisis situations and war situations, um, I have come to, I've come to be very thankful for an 80% solution. I don't, I don't get wrapped around the axle by the, getting the last 20%. Of course, it would be great to have the last 20%. But if everyone is going to demand that they have perfection in information and that a fire truck comes to sit outside their house whenever the, there's a hot day, well, there's something fundamentally wrong. There may be a requirement and an individual responsibility, Grant. There may be an individual responsibility for all of us. And I live on a block. I live on a 20-acre block, which will burn. And we were we spent two days ready to evacuate the place, um, uh, 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 but there may be an individual responsibility to be individually resilient. That is, when it comes to running away time, we've all got to be ready to run away. That applies to the military as well, Grant. 
we would retreat, we would scroll. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, Tristan, now hearing that and knowing the stuff that you know about um, data-driven decision-making and the support that you're able to provide to decision-makers with the different layers of information technology, the use of, use of Internet of Things, the use of different data analysis layers, how can you or what have you seen out there that can help really get that 80% plus solution that's so desired and so required, uh, not just for the emergency management services, but also for people uh, like us that have to make a decision about our own safety and well-being. Yeah, definitely. So much you can unpack there, like the data part of it. And let me just start with data is important, but it's also the trust and the quality and how we use the data. So we've talked a lot about just listening to these, the, the conversation going on, which is fantastic around what's happened. Um, how do we get that messaging out to people? So how do people understand data? So we've talked a lot about, you know, data is available. We can use artificial intelligence. We can do this, we can do that. Um, I always liken it to, we can teach a car to drive with data better than an individual can without having an accident. So we can do anything we can with data when we've got trust, but it's all things like iconography, for example, and you know, the fires near me app, for example, it's like, it's not just, you know, everyone speaks a different language. How do we get messages to the right people at the right time to do the right thing, to make them individually resilient, as, as you mentioned before, you know, using those icons, using the right data in the right way and the right fashion, because then we can feed it into artificial intelligence. There's so much data out there. We could, you know, we, we look at what the mining industry have been doing for years around digital twins, right? We could create a platform where we could almost build a twin of Australia and then see where the fires are burning or where the floods are or, um, and, and work out what direction using data to feed into it that, that, can, uh, that can enforce that, which is amazing when you, when you look at what, what the next stage of, of what you can do is. And then it's all about the speed and the ability to kind of keep that secure and available at any point in time. Because the worst thing is when you become reliant on data or you've got bad mobile reception or anything like that, you can't be waiting on it to be delivered to you. Um, and we look at it from an AI perspective of, you know, if we take in all different sources of data, people feed it in, you get weather patterns, you get history patterns, you get everything else like that, you get imagery, you get stuff that's, you know, flying through on drones or aircraft or firefighting um, helicopters, anything like that that can feed through that imagery, you can tell things that are going to happen. Um, we look at it from the perspective of then humans become the weakest link in it, right? We can teach anything to do anything that a human can do, but a hell of a lot quicker. And that's that's a key thing there. So that's what we're trying to, to look at. Um, and uh, and and just back to Shane's comment before around betterment. Um, and then before you mentioned about the eighty percent as well, Jim. We call that the anti fragile approach. Expect things are going to break, but build back really quickly and build it better. So and it's the same thing with data, right? If you get to eighty percent or something, that is good enough. But know that you're going to have to keep changing and reforming that as you go through and, and not to be afraid of the answer you get now. Well, we can quickly change it as long as we've captured it and we pass that through. Um, and then just on the final point, the, the mention of COVID before as well in the pandemic, people are willing to give data now. I think this world has kind of opened up a lot. I mean, I'll take, I'll walk into a cafe and I'll scan a QR code without reading their privacy policy every day of the week just to get a coffee, right? If we're willing to share to get something, we will get more valuable data out of the community and also out of other areas that we can use in, in a lot more detail. Good question has come from the audience here. It's saying that the, the, some of the best known data and security stories have been around Facebook and similar social media pl platforms with their issues that they've had. So I think Cambridge Analytica or other sort of issues that happened there. Um, you know, to your point there, Tristan, and, and for the wider audience here as well, you know, is there some mistrust that exists around the use of big data um, and how it's, you know, captured, but then also used? It's, I, I put it to early adoption, right? So Cambridge Analytica, even Facebook, these are, I mean, we're in a world, I think you mentioned 13 years, but if you think back, like, you know, even 10 15 years, less than that, you know, you're using television and radio to communicate, right? We're really in the early days of data, right? And how we're using it. And there's always going to be mistrust of everything. The first time you get in an autonomous vehicle, you're not going to trust it's going to get you to the right place. And it's the same thing with data as we have matured with governance and security around that over the years. And that's really important. You've got to take it on the journey and give it the opportunity. Um, the pandemic has kind of accelerated that and given us a second wave of that. So, you know, pre that, we're looking at all the Facebook trust issues, et cetera, around you know, the data that's coming through and people wanting to share with certain platforms and not other platforms and knowing what data is going out there. 
but when it's used in the right way, it's enormously powerful. And that's the governance element of it. And that's where your know, policy can come into it. That's where uh, guidelines and procedures and, and, and other areas that can come into it. And um, the other big piece is cloud in that, in that equation. You know, Amazon's been in Australia since 2014. We forget that we're reliant on this cloud or 2013 and Microsoft about the same time. You know, it hasn't even been here for 10 years. And this is the lifeblood of how we feed this data to, to, to a different area at any time. Facebook hasn't even been around that long. So it's, it's a maturity thing when we look at where we're going. So um, that will mature. Um, you know, enterprise scale systems don't have those problems. Um, and, and we just got to take that back into the kind of the more mass market um, arena, which is what Facebook and social media have. Um, and I'll just add to that, the final point on that is it's also about user and how it's been used. I mean, Cambridge Analytica, I don't know what was all, you know, it was, you gave it to someone and how did they use it and what was the intent of it? Um, you know, it's, it, get data into the right hands for the right people and it'll be used the right way. Commissioner Fitzsimmons, you were uh, known as that trusted face of the buyers in 2019 to 2020. How important was data to inform and, and really give the people out there what they needed to know? Uh, to make their own decisions? Uh, it, it's fundamental, Grant, and, and getting data and information from the coalface, from the front line, through, through reliable, robust uh, systems was really important. And in times of crisis, it's even more so because when, when things are not going to plan, when things are falling apart at a community level, we want those systems of information flow to be working at their best. So, so governments in emergency services, particularly when you're going to the market and you want products and tools like, like a fires near me app, like a website, when everything else is failing, you want them to be working. You want the best possible performance um, expectations that you can factor into contract and, and availability. And, and people do get funny when it comes to data and sharing. And, and it wasn't lost on me just in the last, in the last six or 12 months. Uh, the federal government rolled out the COVID Safe app, and there was there was this campaign of information running. Oh, you can't trust the government. You can't trust them. What are they going to do with our information? But the irony was, people were saying that and running that conversation on social media platform. The irony was extraordinary. Um, so, so we are funny as human beings with what we think is a, a trust issue and not a trust issue with data. But ultimately, in the in the government and public information space, we are absolutely invested in making sure that we that we are building systems uh, that are virtuous, that are absolutely uh, with the intent of doing good and doing better for people. Uh, that is the core focus, not to misuse uh, and, and build a, a, a break in that trust contract. And, and I think the example is with, with the QR codes, what we've been doing in the last, you know, six, 12 months in New South Wales alone, but as a nation is having agile, up-to-date, critically important websites and public facing tools to give people the latest information, the updates on what they can and can't do, what the restrictions are, what the progress is up to. Government sponsored QR codes. So there is a, a, a trust element that goes to a trusted source of government. If you use this QR code, you're already linked to your other government services anyway, and it helps with contract tracing and it helps with the saving of lives. So there is always a mixed view in society, but I think as a general rule, um, um, trust is a, is a contract. Um, uh, that it's built between us uh, and those using our data uh, and helping share information back to us when it comes times of, of uncertainty, particularly, or times of crisis. Rounding it off now, uh, Senator Molan, you know, trust is so crucial to the effectiveness of what any politician delivers. Um, and to, uh, I mean, fortunately, we've had some, you know, some pretty poor examples over time or some criticism that's been uh, directed towards politicians around trust in the community. How important is the engage with technology and your understanding and use of that to informing your trust discussions with your community? Well, I, I'd take the next step on from what Shane has spoken about. And uh, uh, Shane mentioned both the fires and COVID in relation to trust. And I would say that what we, and this is my experience from Iraq in, in the, the war in Iraq 10 years ago, I, as Chief of Operations, I was at the centre of the most highly, tech, the high technology headquarters that warfare has ever seen in the history of warfare of the world. And yet, 
when we wanted something done, what did we do? We turned to a person. And, uh, but what enables that person to be trusted is the data that goes into their brain beforehand. And this is the link that I think uh, as Shane was talking about in that what he's talking about is human leadership. And uh, the, the, the general that I worked for, the American general I worked for would, would spend four days out of seven traveling around Iraq, visiting people, talking to people, establishing the kind of trust. He'd spend all day out of the headquarters. He'd come back each night and, and uh, read himself back into what was happening during the day, knowing that the headquarters would run what was happening during the day. Uh, what we've seen in the fires, we saw you, you, you described uh, Shane as the trusted face, and that's exactly what he was. And if we go back to COVID, we see that uh, reinforced every single day. And God help us, we all got sick to death of it. But every <laughs> single day for the last nine months, we've seen our state leaders and our federal leaders on TV about 10 or 11 o'clock telling us how good they're doing the job. Now, we as, we, we as consumers of that trust, uh, we, will, we will interpret that trust as we want, but it's a different thing. We might get all the fires, fires near me, all that kind of stuff that you want, but, but uh, uh, when, 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 when it comes down to it, we will turn on the TV and we will look at what our Premier says, what the Commissioner says, and what those that we trust say. And, and uh, th this, is what, this is what technology is all about. Technology will enable us as, as human beings and as, as leaders to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to be trusted. And some of the irresponsibility of the media on occasions, who then often the media is not, is, is, is not in, invested in the idea of trust. They, they couldn't care less. Some media elements could not care less whether a leader is trusted, whether they deserve trust. They want a story and they are prepared to magnify and amplify that story as much as they possibly can, even at the expense of the trust of the individual. So those two things work very interestingly. Well, that's a good way to round us off. Thank you, gentlemen. And, and what I'm going to do now is pause and I'll get Georgina if we can just to uh, enable us to open up to the floor. We've got two questions that have come through, which we haven't had a chance to get through yet. Um, but I think we'll take the next 15 minutes or 14 minutes now and uh, aim to wrap up on time for everyone in, uh, in the audience. So, uh, Georgina, do you want to take us through the first question there, please? Of course, thank you. So this question is for Tristan. Can you confirm that the Fires Near Me app takes around 45 minutes to update information? Uh, the second part to that question is why it takes uh, so long and is there anything being done to change that um, given there were 3 million downloads? Yeah, uh, to start with, I don't believe it does take 45 minutes. We, we have a team uh, when we're in hypercare, and I think during the, the, the peak of the, the fire season last year, uh, working 24 by 7 on it. Um, the data gets refreshed. People contribute data to that, so it needs to go through a few channels and checks and stuff. So it's, it's variable time every time. And I think back to <laughs> someone that uh, Senator Mullen said before around it's, it's the people involved in it. Um, the better we get with technology, the quicker that data is going to move through. So we can do autonomous checks and stuff like that of data coming through. We get more real-time information that's not fed from people and communities. It's fed through you know, uh, imagery and, um, and weather patterns and stuff like that. We'll, we'll get to that level, but that's real-time data. But whenever you involve humans in the loop of any technology, it can slow things down. Thank you. Uh, the next question can, is open to the floor. So what are the main barriers to Australian tech companies from introducing robust and effective digital solutions to weather events or public health and safety crises? I might jump in on that one again and, and then throw to someone else. Um, look, the barrier is, is investment. Um, so we're, we're a local Australian company, you know, 400 odd techies who, who build this solution. This is what drives us and makes, that makes us passionate. So there are skills, we've heard a lot around, there aren't the skills out there. Absolutely, there are the skills in Australia, right? Um, we can build this in, in any way. Um, the adoption of technology and being able to get through it, but I'll, I'll get back to the point before around trust. Um, people now trust data um, and, and trust digital technology, and that has accelerated this year particularly. So now, now's the time I can see a lot of investment. The investment is being made um, to, 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 to put this technology in place. 
And also the anti-fragile um, term I used before, don't be afraid to build something that's not going to be with you for the next 20 years. Build it, know if it's going to break, fix it and build it again and continuous, continuously deploy because that's the only way to keep up with technology and trends. I'm happy to add to that if you want, Georgina. That would be great. Thank you. I, I think from a uh, from a from my experience in in the roles that I've had over time, if I had a dollar for every software company that they that said they had the solution for us, if we would give them hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars, I wouldn't need to work. So so what we've got, we've got to get this balance right. We've got to get this balance right between um, ideas and innovation versus uh, conceptual um, uh, products and solutions that can actually attract. Um, uh, investment uh, and take up from government. Uh, we don't have the luxury of big budgets to run experimentation all the time. But I do agree with Tristan. Um, uh, we do invest in programs where we know uh, there is there is the example, there is the there is the proof of concept, there is uh, existing use somewhere else. So it is a real challenge to work out how do we test that market, and and that comes down to where to where do venture capitalists and other things uh, uh, sit in terms of uh, developing and honing um, uh, business uh, and, and um, technology uh, organisations in Australia to get these products to market, to, to partner with organisations in industry and governments uh, to understand what's needed and how it might work and present options and proposals that can be adopted and then further developed. Uh, the idea of coming uh, to, to me as a government organisation saying, I can do this for you, I've got wonderful ideas, but it's going to cost you millions of dollars, trust me, it ain't going to fly. Senator Mullen, in that regard, you know, the Defence Procurement has, uh, has investment for innovation and the like there. Is there a similar shape towards looking at innovation and, and supporting innovation um, for emergency management across Australia, given we are exposed every year, it's a natural disaster? It, yes, I, I guess I guess there is grant, but I wouldn't hold up the defence procurement organisation as the uh, the high mark. I'm afraid, <laughs> uh, you know, as soon as we do something serious like 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 the RFS do every day of the week, we change the system entirely, and we 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 have a much more responsive system, which is what we did for in during Afghanistan and Iraq. We changed the system entirely, and during peacetime, when we believe that we have no threat. Uh, ridiculously believe when we have no threat, we, we take 100 years to build a submarine. You know, uh, 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 so, so let's not hold that up as that. But uh, I, I just comment on what Shane said. And, and I, reckon, I reckon every day I'd get at least one proposition from someone who has the answer to all my problems. So I totally identify, and it's normally a technological, have you thought of such and such? Well, in all probability, yes, <laughs> we have. And uh, and as Shane said, give me a couple of million dollars and I'll solve all your problems. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I can't add anything more to that. I'm sorry. Now, we got a question from Ben Smythe. Uh, uh, we've, it says about fires near me was vital for community as well as us in the media to be able to share best updated information. However, my region crosses the New South Wales Victorian border and fires near me doesn't. Uh, what plans are in place to improve cross-border data and data sharing for such public-facing emergency information? So it's Ben Smythe from the Bigger District News. I'm happy to comment on that. Yeah, so I'll just jump in really quickly, Shane. I'm, yeah, it, it is just New South Wales, and, and you're right, fires have no borders, but I think, yeah, actually, Shane, you're probably better to answer it than me. From a technology perspective, there's no reason it can't be borderless, and it should be. Well, the, the, it, it's technology, te technologically, it is pretty simple to see the boundaries um, um, blur. Um, and already there is a body of work going on between the commissioners, Commissioner Rob Rogers uh, and his colleagues around the country. But also what goes with that are the fundamental operational constructs that, that the decisions behind ranking and grading of fires and the ranking and grading of warnings that attach to different communities. And... And there's ultimately a level of subjectivity that applies to that to that risk profile and that risk matrix of fire spread, level of predictability and likely impact and, and what you've got in terms of capacity and wherewithal to limit that impact or protect communities. So 
it's not always just about uh, the data set of, of the fire uh, spread or, or burnt area uh, and whether it's crossing a border or not. There are a lot of other operational decisions and resourcing that attaches to that to derive uh, the alert level and the warnings and what have you. So, so it's more than just the technology solution that's got to be able to provide uh, the tool for cross-border work and remembering that whilst whilst the fires near me app, and yes, we developed it in New South Wales and we've offered it up and it's being rebranded uh, for use in other jurisdictions. So it's the same platform, the same technology being used in other jurisdictions, some other jurisdictions. Um, the technology can very easily go across boundaries, but um, it's, it's actually about the operational management of things and remembering that the tool is just not a strategic picture to say this is where the fires are and this is where they're up to. It's actually also a very tactical operational tool which will vary from one location to another. And just because a fire is burning one area doesn't mean it automatically attracts an operational output in terms of uh, warnings or alerts. And that there is some real challenge there with the, uh, with the operational management between borders, but the technology uh, can ready, readily resolve uh, movement between between jurisdictions I just, and I there's should, a lot of work going on. Yeah, I should just add one point. So out of the Royal Commission, there's obviously been the standards that have come out around iconography. I love that word, it's a new term, but um, it's yeah. around standards of icons and standards of language. So forget the technology, you could have, you know, could have a different platform for every state. The most important thing is going to be that you're talking the same language. Right. And, and Tristan, and, and we've just we've just uh, launched the latest iteration of the National Warnings Framework. It was the largest body of research, as I understand it, uh, ever undertaken across Australia to get to get sentiment and understanding and feedback from communities affected, not affected, everywhere from cyclone storms, floods, bushfires, all sorts of things. And and there is a standard suite of symbology um, uh, and and monoculture being attached to how we graduate effectively a, a three-tier warnings framework for fire and other emergencies across the state. And that will increasingly be rolled out, particularly as we roll out in the fire space, uh, the new fire danger rating system, which has been a massive body of work, collaboration between the feds and the jurisdictions, um, uh, specialist science organisations and those sorts of things, to better be able to be more granular uh, in fire dangers and and ratings uh, and therefore warnings, but then also tying a nationally consistent methodology to fires, to floods, to storms, to cyclones, to, to whatever um, uh, is really coming out of that significant body of work over recent years. And it's really culminating in, a, in an end product now, which we'll see rolling out uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, and that's so hugely important, even more so sometimes in the tech. And the other part that you mentioned in there too, which without saying explicitly, is a user interface to it and how you interface with it. Because, you know, we think very easily about the mobile app. Yep, that's easy. We can create the most, you know, exciting, best looking app, but it's or, or website or even however you're going to communicate out. But you've got to think about so many different, you know, ways that people are going to integrate, how they're going to use it, when they're going to use it. You know, the battery even behind the, the platform that uses it, the languages, the visibility behind, not everyone's you know, equally as able, all that sort of stuff. And that can be equally as important as the technology too. So I think you know, there's consistency between language and, and interface. It doesn't, you know, the technology is going to be different in the back end, but, you know, and then it, it, they should be the same, but at least that way there's a standard across it all. Well, um, that just about concludes us there, uh, ladies and gentlemen online, and also gentlemen uh, as part of the expert panel today. Um, firstly, I want to take a, a moment to thank our experts who were on the panel today, Commissioner Shane Fitzsimmons and Senator Jim Molan. Both of you have been tremendous today. We, we really value your input and expertise. And Tristan uh, Sternton, the CEO of ARC Group, we really value your insights into how data has been able to shape um, both what we're doing now from a disaster preparedness point of view and what we're shaping for in the future. So, uh, gentlemen, thanks for your insight today and really appreciate you taking the time to join us before Christmas. Uh, for the rest thank of you, yeah, for the rest of you, thank you and have a safe and uh, Merry Christmas and let's hope to have a safe and happy new year. Thanks, Grant. All the best. Thanks, Art. Cheers.